Jeff. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Great. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I want to start with taking you back to my senior year in high school. It's a long time ago. And I was playing in a football game. It was, it was the seventh game of my, of my senior year. Uh, we had lost every single game my, my junior year, and we had lost the first six games of my senior year. And I was a very mediocre football player on a really lousy team. And it was late in the game. In this particular game, I actually had a pretty good game. I had caught a touchdown pass, and I had caught a couple other passes. So I was having a pretty good game, and we were actually within kind of striking distance of potentially winning the game. And as we, we were on the opponent's 10-yard line, and as the quarterback rolled out, I was in the end zone, and I, I happened to be open, but the quarterback didn't see me. And, and I, I had to, in a split second, decide, should I raise my hand and let the quarterback know that I was open, or should I, you know, and, and thereby, you know, take the chance that he throws me the ball and I drop the ball and become the goat? Or should I, you know, not raise my hand and let the quarterback, you know, have his chances if he gets in the end zone? And my decision, it felt like an eternity in that split second of, of my calculus. And I ended up making a decision that's kind of haunted me, but then formatively changed me for years. I made the decision not to raise my hand. And the quarterback didn't see me. He ended up getting tackled, and we ended up losing. And I struggled with that so much afterwards. Because, and what really was the reality of it was I was more afraid of failing you know, than I was afraid of being mediocre at that time in my life. I didn't have enough confidence in myself to really step out there and appreciate what I really, what I really could do. It was only later that I learned that I had more fear about being mediocre than I did about failing, which is ultimately what pushed me over the entrepreneurial uh, uh, cliff, if you, if you will. The second one um, that I want to mention is uh, failing at my, getting my uh, lifeguard certificate when I was 16. And I thought I studied. I, I thought I did the practical exams. I thought I did all of that. But I failed miserably on both. I failed on the practical exam, and I failed on the, on the, on the test. And for years, again, I, I agonized over how could I fail a lifeguarding test? How could I do something to fail something like that? But when I realized what it did for me, it was one of those formative moments that it taught me the rest of my life that I better out-prepare everything. So today, I'm not necessarily the sharpest guy intellectually in the room, but I will outwork anyone in the room. And I learned that kind of the secret to a successful 40-hour work week is to work 80. And that's just how I can, that's just how I, how I can do it. I also learned uh, the value of networking. I got a pretty good job out of graduate school uh, because, I, um, because I went to a pretty good graduate school. I went to a pretty good graduate school because I had a pretty good job you know, before that. I got a pretty good job before that because I got a pretty good internship. I got a pretty good internship because I was involved in the accounting society at my school, and I hosted uh, different firms to come into town to meet with the, the students. And as they were coming in to meet with the students, I realized that, hey, you know, I can network with these people, and I can you know, maybe you know, do something good for myself. And I did that, and it kind of helped. And the value of networking is just so important, you know, particularly at a, at a younger age. I'll give you one other example of the value of networking. How, how many of you have heard of uh, the economist Jeffrey Sachs? So most people have heard of him. I, you're far ahead of me. I didn't know who he was five years ago. But as I started on my quest to learn about poverty alleviation and extreme poverty, I kept stumbling across his name when I was Googling around and, and doing web surfing. And one night I decided, you know, one, one night I found his email on one of the blogs I was reading. And I thought, what the heck? I'm going to email this guy. He'll probably never respond, but I'm going to try. So I emailed him at, you know, 11 o'clock at night. Got back there the next morning at 7 a.m., there was an email from Jeffrey Sachs. And it, said, you know, and it said, hey, Jeff, nice to meet you. You know, if you can call me at 1010, you know, call me, and I'd love to talk with you. So I decided uh, between 7 and 10, I better research who he was. And th <laughs> thankfully, I hadn't done it the night before. I probably never would have emailed him. And I got on the phone with him at 1010 that, that morning. And uh, you know, we had a nice 20-minute conversation. He invited me to New York to, to meet with him. And he said, I'm sorry, Jeff, I've got to go. I've got the president of Malawi in my office. <laughs> and I thought, geez, I, mean, I really felt you know, awestruck. And I, my point is, you, know, you may call that email stalking, but I do it all the time. I do it with LinkedIn. I do it with email. I probably email 10 people a week that I don't know. And you know, probably you know, nine of them don't respond. But the one that responds tends to sometimes open a door. And you know, sometimes we don't want to do that, but I would really encourage you to kind of push yourself out of your comfort zone and try doing that kind of thing. 
I wanted to give you a little bit of my, um, my experience. I think it's relevant in talking about commercial entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. And I spent four years in public accounting uh, at Ernst & Young where I really learned what a CPA you know, really means. It means cut, paste, and attach. <laughs> and that was about the extent of my, uh, my, uh, my, I knew I didn't want to be an accountant forever, but I felt like it was a great language of business to, to really learn. Uh, and then I spent 12 years you know, involved in a middle market kind of no-name company. And sometimes I think we get you know, our brains, we want to go work for the big consulting firm or the big you know, investment bank or the big brand or whatever. And in, in reality, sometimes the middle market type companies, you can get really great experience you know, just by working in a middle market business. This was about a three or $400 million business. And I was able to you know, move around and moved, I think I moved 10 times in 10 years. And I was able to move around and get lots of different general management you know, uh, experience. And it was really a great experience for me. Um, but t towards my, the end of my, my late 30s, I began to really think, I want to go off on my own. And I want to you know, take that entrepreneurial plunge. I want to do that. My wife, who is uh, Mediterranean and first generation American, you know, has the risk tolerance of Richard Branson. So she's always pushing, 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 you know, to kind of do that. But I grew up kind of Midwesternish, and, you know, I had a very, you know, risk averse, you know, a somewhat risk averse profile. But I knew I kind of wanted to do that. I knew I wanted to do that. And I felt like I was standing on a high board, blindfolded, wondering if there was water in the pool beneath me knowing that I want to take that plunge, but I just can't quite take that plunge because I wasn't sure if there was water in the pool. And then, to make matters worse, my mom piled on, and she wanted me to do it. And then when your mom wants you to do something, you know maybe it's a bad idea, right? Because I remember when I played high school football, and we lost the game 42 to nothing, and I had a horrible game, and I came into the house, and she said, well, I thought you played good, honey. So, you know, I just wasn't quite there. But, you know... I was, I, one night I was channel surfing late, and I came across an interview, and it was, the interviewer was going around, and he was, he was interviewing about 10 people, senior citizens, and he was asking, asking them what did they wish they had done differently in their careers. And every single one of those people said they wish they had taken more business risk. They wish they had kind of put it out there a little bit further. And the last thing you want to do is get to that stage in your life and feel like, geez, if only I had kind of taken that shot. You know, I'd much rather take the shot and be able to look back and say, hey, I took the shot. It didn't work, but I took the shot. I gave it everything I got. And I realized at that time that I had switched my paradigm from that high school football example of being you know, more afraid of failing. Now I was more afraid of being mediocre than I was of, of failing. So I worked out a deal with my uh, employer uh, to leave, and I spent uh, three, uh, three months basically working with them on a transition plan. I was running a couple hundred million dollar business, and I, um, I worked out a deal with them, and I felt really good about that deal. I was, took a tremendous amount of integrity in doing that, and I would really encourage any of you, to the extent you leave somewhere, you, you, know, you only have your good name in life to really leave as your, as your legacy. And, and it ended up, as I left, um, after I left, I wanted to go find a company to buy and, and build. And there had been a company that um, we passed on in the company that I was at just before I left. And I was out looking for businesses, and I remembered that company. So I went back to the CEO of the company, and I said, hey, do you mind if I contact these guys? We passed on them you know, previously. And they said, yeah, no problem. It was a conflict. It, it didn't make sense for us in, in that particular situation. And that was the company I ended up buying. So you know, really not burning bridges, you know, really doing things right you know, is really so important. I want to give you a little bit of a, a, a synopsis on um, the six. I've done six deals, commercial, for-profit, traditional deals, since I went off on my own. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the things that were common between the good ones and the things that were common between the bad ones. And I had, of the six, four were good, two were really good, not quite as good as Instagram, um, but, they were, but they were pretty good, and two were uh, horrific, kind of cratered on the rocks and you know, bad, bad news story. Um, and a couple of the, um, the things that are important, um, the two bad ones, uh, the economic cycle and the timing of the economic cycle, you know, were both um, right before a recession. So I bought one right in 1999 and I bought one in 2006. And it's really difficult um, in the type that I would do, which were leveraged acquisitions, the type that I would do if the economy turns on you, you don't have a lot of room to, to, to maneuver. 
The second thing is uh, gross margins. You know, if you've got a 30% gross margin, you know, you don't have a lot of room to kind of, you know, bob and weave if all of a sudden you hit a pothole. If you've got a 60 or 70% gross margin, you've got a lot more room to make a mistake and kind of and weather that. You're also tying up a lot less cash in working capital or in, in receivables and, and in inventory. I also learned, you know, you want to share the upside with people, but be really careful of the dilution. It's really, I know two people that started businesses and ended up selling them each for over $100 million, and they each ended up with only 5% of the company. Now, you might say, and you're right, 5% of $100 million is a lot of money, and it is, but there's no reason they shouldn't have had 30 or 40% of those companies. And what tends to happen is if I'm starting a company and I, and I want to have Johnny come work with me because I know he's got some skill set, it's really easy to say, hey, Johnny, come work with me, and I'll give you 10% of the company. And Johnny says, okay, I'll come work with you, 10% of the company. Well, you kind of forget about that. Well, Johnny doesn't forget about that, right? <laughs> Whereas you could say to Johnny, hey, Johnny, come work with me. I'll let you share on the upside with me. I'll give you some options. It'll be great. You know, we'll work it that way. And Johnny will be thrilled, generally, you know, to come, to come and work in that. So, be, you know, I really strongly believe in sharing the upside with those that perform and people that are with you. But I also don't believe in just giving, giving it away. And it's really easy, particularly in startups, you know, to be very easy about giving it away. I know people that have given it away, actually, and then those people didn't even stay with the company. So they left, but they still were, um, they, they still were vested in, in, the, in the equity that they had. Really understand your partners. The two um, uh, companies that did not work, I knew in my gut, I just knew at the time I was buying them, you know, deep down that these guys that I was buying their businesses from weren't great characters. They didn't have the integrity that I really needed to have. And when, you, when you're buying a business or building a business, integrity is just so important, the integrity of the people that you're working with and what you're seeing and what you're doing. Um, I also believe very strongly in breaking bread you know, with your prospective partner and taking your spouse or your partner or your friend with you and actually meeting with, with, their, with them and their, and their spouse or their partner. There's a lot in a casual setting that can kind of come out and you can, you know, interpret things. And, you know, if you're a, you know, left brain person but your spouse is a right brain person, you, you'll see things very differently. And I think it's really important, you know, to be able to do that in order to really understand the partners that you're working with. Around about my early 40s, you know, my wife and I began to, you know, think about, you know, transitioning from, you know, what was a, a more of a concentration in kind of um, uh, business success to more of life significance. And, you know, we felt like we'd lived a significant life all along, but we really wanted to move much more of our concentration, you know, over, that, over, over to that. So we began to kind of look around, and I thought, you know, do I want to do another deal? Um, do I want to, and at the end of the day, what are they going to put on my tombstone? Are they going to say, you know, he worked another deal, you know, he, he multiplied his money X, X, X a bit more? No, hopefully not. Hopefully they're going to say, I was a good human being, I was a good parent, I was a good spouse, I made a, different, I made a difference in the life of another. And we began to really think about, you know, how do we, you know, create a business where we can transition to that? And we started to study social enterprises and social entrepreneurship, which is what I really want to talk to you about today. Can these products actually help save the world? Can something as basic as a bottle of Newman's own salad dressing actually bring joy to a child with a life-threatening disease? Can a bottle of water sold here in the United States actually help bring clean water to someone in, in the developing world? Can a pair of Tom's shoes purchased at Nordstrom's you know, actually put shoes on someone else's feet in South America? And can something as basic as a ream of office paper, not much more basic than that, right? Can that actually provide a meal for a family of five for a week? And the answer is, yes, they can. And they're doing it through a you know, really interesting model called social entrepreneurship. And I want to talk a little bit about what this model is. There's, there's tremendous overlap between commercial entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. They're very difficult to, to, to pull apart. You know, I do feel like they, they, you can pull them a little bit apart by, by the mission of the business. Is the mission of the business to really you know, fulfill a societal challenge, a societal solution, or is the mission of the business to you know, create value and economic return and that kind of stuff for, for shareholders? And just as I say that, there's a bunch of you know, counters that I would say against it. Uh, but they're very similar in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the implementation of them. And I feel like oftentimes social entrepreneurs screw up because they, they look at their business as, you know, nine parts cause, one part business. 
when in fact, in the beginning, it's got to be nine parts business, one part cause. Because if the business doesn't stay around long enough because it can't make it, you can't do anything about the cause. So in the early days of a social entrepreneurship, a social enterprise, there, it, it's all about making the business successful so that you can deliver whatever kind of give back model you've got. But on the, on the left, we've got the traditional for-profit businesses. And you know, they give back tremendous amounts. I'm a large, significant, free market, you know, pro-capitalism you know, believer. And I believe these businesses give back tremendous amounts of money. Uh, but in the end, you know, ideally, I mean, in the end, legally, you know, they're really focused on creating economic return for their shareholders. And they can't be entirely focused on this, this, other, this other model. And on the right side, you've got the, the nonprofits. And you know, to be honest, they focus most of their time on fundraising. And the other portion of their time they spend on development. So they don't really have the time to create you know, true businesses. And, and oftentimes, the NGOs aren't necessarily the best business people you know, in the world. So in the middle here, in the bottom, you've got this hybrid model of social entrepreneurship, social enterprises. And the beauty of this is they can be anything. You know, they can be for-profit businesses that are donating, in our case, 100% of its profits, or they can be for-profit businesses that are donating you know, 2%, or they can be you know, donating a pair of shoes for every pair of shoes they sell. You know, they can be very different models. There's no right or wrong in that, in my, in my mind anyway. You know, and on the other hand, you can have nonprofits that actually create sister companies. And those sister companies you know, are for-profit entities that maybe are helping lower their admin rate so they can uh, attract more dollars. And I think it's a really exciting model uh, because of that. So who are you know, these change makers? And we all know of the people you know, like Gandhi and Mandela and Mother Teresa. And they truly are larger than life um, uh, people. But I believe that there's someone else in this room, and I believe it's you, who also can be a social entrepreneur and can really focus on this type of business. And I think you can find tremendous happiness, fulfillment, and economic you know, return by doing it. See, I believe that ordinary people, just like you and I, can do extraordinary things. And you, know, you've, you, you, you hear about the Mandelas and all those guys, but they all started out as ordinary people. They just kind of pushed one foot in front of the other and kind of jumped off that, you know, out of their comfort zone and, and made it happen. And one of the things I think, the more, you know, academic we get, the more intellectual we get, the more education we get, the more we learn all the reasons, you know, that businesses fail. And a lot of them do fail. But in fact, you know, you got to take that step. You know, what we should do is twist that paradigm and say, instead of knowing all the reasons that they don't work, we should say, okay, now I know all the reasons that businesses do fail. Let me use those to make sure that my business doesn't fail. And I think we have to twist that. I think we have to twist that paradigm. I want to give you an example of two uh, social entrepreneurs that have done incredible things. The first is a guy named Craig Kielberger. Has anybody ever heard of Free the Children organization? Um, not many people. It's an uh, organization that Craig, when he was 12 years old, started. Craig was a 12-year-old kid living in uh, Toronto. And he was reading the Sunday paper. And he came across an article of another 12-year-old boy who was murdered while protesting against child labor in Indonesia. And he said, Mom, Dad, you know, i gotta, I got to go pro protest on Iqbal's behalf. And his parents said, well, Craig, you know, kind of two problems. One, we don't have any money. And two, you're only 12. And you know, he said, well, I'm going to raise the money. I'm going to find somebody to go with me. I'm going to make it happen. And he did. He did bake sales. He did all kinds of stuff to raise the money to be able to go to Indonesia. He went over to Indonesia. Just so happened that the prime minister of Canada happened to be there at the same time. And he heard about this 12-year-old Canadian that was there. The two of them connected. And the rest is kind of history. That was 17 years ago. Today, he runs an organization that educates 50,000 people in the developing world every single day just because he took that small step out of his comfort zone to make it happen. The second is an individual named David Perez. You won't have heard of him. You know, he's a friend of mine from San Diego. And when Katrina occurred, you know, David said, he came to me a day or two into it and said, Jeff, you know, I'm really dissatisfied. Change isn't happening fast enough. We're not getting medical supplies to the people that need it on the ground. And I said, uh, OK, I don't really know what you're going to do. He was a middle class guy living in San Diego and didn't really have any money. And, but he said, I'm going to figure it out. And I said, all right. And three days later, he showed back up on my doorstep. And it looked like he hadn't slept in three days. And in fact, he hadn't slept in three days. And he said, Jeff, I'm going in. And it sounded like a code word to me. I really wasn't sure what going in meant. You know? But he said, I'm going in. I'm going to make it happen. So he took a couple weeks off from his work. And he, you know, uh, by the time it was over, 
He had been on the phone with Richard Branson. He'd been on the phone with Michael Dell. He'd been on the phone with senators and congressmen. He'd been on the phone with people on the ground. He ended up raising enough money through, and, and getting in-kind donations of people's airplanes to fly 72 727s into New Orleans carrying medical supplies. And, and he ended up taking a, a full load of people out of New Orleans to San Diego where he, he relocated them, all because he had enough chutzpah. He just kind of put it out there. He had a Rolodex. He started calling people. He, wasn't, he, didn't get, he, didn't get, he didn't get no as a bad word to him. And I believe that if people like this, and just like you guys, and just like me, we can all do this. I think we're at the beginning of a really powerful and really exciting wave of social entrepreneurship. And to, unlike you know, a lot of things that are on the horizon that are kind of looming and they're, you know, they're, kinda, they're not so good, they're dark clouds on the horizon, this is a really powerful, positive thing. And, there, and, and it's a power and posit a positive thing because you can really be part of this movement. And I think it's going to be moving for a long period of time. And it has to do with five principal things. The first is you guys, young people. Young people today you know, want to be part of something bigger than themselves, and they also want to make a buck. And you can do both. You don't want to wait 30 years to, you know, to do that. And you don't have to wait 30 years to it. You can kind of get right at it. The second thing is the internet. The internet you know, brings these global issues to our laptops 24-7. They're coming right at us. We can't turn them off. You know, you heard about, um, you've all heard of Coney 2012, pretty much, on the Invisible Children. You know, I mean, that uh, went viral where 80 million people watched that video in one week you know, because of 17 to 29-year-olds texting it, uh, uh, Facebooking it, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, tweeting it, kind of doing everything you know, with it. And these issues, they're coming to us, and now there's a vehicle to communicate and to inform that didn't exist before. The third thing is also the internet. The internet makes all of us be academic researchers from our laptop. There's no excuse, whether it's a new business you're starting, a, 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 a nonprofit, a for-profit, whatever it is, there's no excuse for any of us not to be experts before we put a business plan together, before we talk to an investor, before we do anything like that, because we can get, right, we can get incredible amounts of information right from our couch with our laptop. I'm, looking at re, I'm researching bringing a coffee product in from Haiti, where we would bring it in, help the local people there, donate the profits back, back to Haiti. And in the period of three days, I was able to talk with uh, USAID people. I was able to get growing reports. I was able to you know, communicate in ways that I would never have been able to do you know, 20 years ago. The fourth thing is celebrities. Celebrities are increasingly using their platforms to pontificate for their causes and what's important to them. And when Bono gets up and talks about ending AIDS, you know, millions of people listen. And millions of people listen not only with their hearts, but they open their wallets and they listen that way too. And finally, the fifth thing is my generation, the baby boomers. As the baby boomers are retiring, a lot of them are giving back significant portions of their net worth. You've probably heard about what Warren Buffett and Bill Gates are, are doing with challenging the billionaire families to give back half of their net worth over the remainder of their lives. I think there are up to 70 families that have agreed to, to do that. And what's really amazing about that is when that money comes back in, you know, that money just doesn't come in and say, okay, do what you want with it, guys. You know, these are people that created value, created businesses. You know, they, they want to hold people accountable. They want, when we look at projects that we want to do, you know, I look at P&Ls of the projects. I force them that, to go through that discipline that, you know, governments just aren't really equipped to be able to do effectively. So I think this whole wave is a really powerful thing. But you might ask, is it really important? And I say, heck, yes, it's important. And the reason it's important is, in part, this graph. If you look at this is a 30-year graph of the pink line is the percentage of, of foreign aid as a percent of uh, gross national product of Africa. And you can see it's rising, rising, rising. And then you can see per capita GDP dropping, dropping, dropping. And you know, they're not only not correlated, they're inversely you know, correlated. And the point is, governments, it doesn't work when governments give money to other governments. There's corruption, there's issues, there's challenges that get in the way. It's got to be bottom up. It's got to be a hand up versus a hand out. I mean, that's really our, that's really our model. It's got to be people like you and I, you know, you know, getting on our social media and really making it happen, you know, that way. Five years ago, um, I had that privilege to have that individual, Craig Kielberger, um, from Free the Children, come to our home. 
and he talked to us about poverty alleviation. And he really, you know, our kids were, I have four kids in high school and middle school, and you know, they were really taken by it. And after he talked at our house, my children came to me and said, you know, you know, mom, dad, we're going to Africa this summer. And I said, well, I don't know how you're going to Africa, you know, this summer, but if you're going, but and my wife, and as a good Jewish mom, said, if you're going, we're all going. So uh, we all upped and went, and we took 20 of us to, to Kenya and Ethiopia for a month, and we actually built water systems, helped build water systems, helped build schools, um, and it became a, a, a really um, transformative experience. And I wanted also my kids to understand the difference in relative poverty and absolute poverty. Relative poverty being, I must be poor, I can't afford the latest iPhone. And absolute poverty being, I live on less than a dollar a day, I walk you know, 10K, sometimes twice a day, oftentimes to get polluted water. We learned about the water crisis. The water crisis is that 4,500 people die every single day because of a lack of clean water. Something as basic, and, you know, uh, as, basic as that. And that's the size of one large public high school evaporating every single day. And 90% of those people are kids under the age of five. We learned that half the hospital beds in the developing world are occupied with people with waterborne you know, related, related diseases. And we learned about the poverty trap. And the poverty trap is that you know, girls can't go to school in most areas because they have to get the water every day for the family. That's their job. And because they get the water every day for the family and they're not going to school, they tend to get uh, married and pregnant at, at 13 and 14 years old. And then their children are born in the same poverty trap, and it's this vicious trap that they can't get out of. And oftentimes, poverty alleviation, it's kind of like a ladder that's just you know, one rung out of reach. And all people need is just a little boost up to grab that bottom rung to begin to climb their, their way out. And while we were there, my 14-year-old uh, daughter, Nina, at the time, you know, came to my wife and I, and she had a bit of an epiphany, and she said, you know, Dad, you know, we really want to do something about this. You know, we'd like to start a business that can kind of help these people, you know, in some way. And, you know, we thought that was a really great idea, and uh, she got together with our other kids and the cousins that were with us, and they actually came up with the name Nika. Nika means to give in, in Zulu. And, you know, before we launched it, we began to think, I began to think about this quote that I really like a lot, which is, the destiny is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. It's not a thing to be waited for, it's a thing to be achieved. And when destiny knocks on your door, you don't say, hold on a second, I gotta, you know, I gotta comb my hair. You know, you don't, I mean, you grab it by the throat, you wrestle it to the ground, you stomp all over it, you make it happen, because you don't know when it's gonna come back again. So, you know, we, as we got back to the United States, you know, we, we began to create Nika. And Nika is a bottled water uh, brand in the United States that donates 100% of its profits to, back to the developing uh, countries. And as we got into it, we picked water. A lot of people go, ooh, why did you pick bottled water? Does the world really need another bottled water company? And as we thought there was something very symbolic about providing clean water or selling water in the United States and providing clean water to others in, in the developing world. But people really struggled with the eco, eco side of it. So we developed Nika with an eco policy that, you know, I, I mean, we believe is kind of best in place kind of eco-wise for a plastic company. We use uh, recycled plastic to, to make the product and we're certified carbon, carbon neutral with the product. And, you know, as we, uh, as we really got into this over the, over the, um, over the years, um, you know, what we realized is that it's only costing $20 to bring clean water to someone for a lifetime. 20 bucks. I spent 12 at Starbucks the other day. I spent 35 at the movie theater the other day with my family. Now, that's not make to make, made to make us feel guilty, but that's made to make us feel like, you know, we can make these tough societal solutions. We can solve these issues without having to give up, you know, without having to give up that other stuff. And we thought if we could be a, a $10 million revenue company, which would mean we'd generate about a million dollars after tax and profits, you know, we could bring clean water to 50,000 people a year. And by doing that, that's kind of one thing, and that's one thing that we're motivated on. But what I'm really motivated on is talking with people like yourself. And if a couple of you guys end up you know, doing your own venture that has some kind of give back component to it, whatever it is. And then if Tom Shoes is doing what it's doing, and Newman Zone's doing what it's doing, and somebody else on the other side of the world is doing what they're doing, now all of a sudden you add all those up, and you've got a sea change of businesses that are in, in, in one way or another giving, giving back. And when those businesses give back, you know, you can move, you can move mountains with it. 
I have a short video that I'd like to show, kind of going through the water crisis, but also as a startup entrepreneurial social venture, it's important to really, you know, kind of have some sizzle when you're a small company and you don't have a godzillion dollars to invest in it. as the air you breathe. I wanted to chat briefly about another topic that's really near and dear to my heart, and I think there's something that's really evolving. It's called conscious consumerism. And I think that there's four forces that are really Focused, focused right now on making it so that we as consumers can really choose the products we want to enjoy. And by choosing the right products, we can help end society's most challenging issues. And it has to do with four things. The first is the concept of social enterprises. I mean, you're seeing at universities all across the country, you know, coursework being taught now on social entrepreneurship. You're seeing hybrid models where in the past people would never, you know, invest money in a for-profit business that has a, uh, a give back, a large give back model, you know, component to it. Um, you're seeing, you know, lots of, you know, um, industry framework be beginning to be created. And on the right side, you've got the internet. You know, when one, one, one in nine people on the planet have Facebook, I mean, it's a huge social media, you know, opportunity. You know, when uh, you know, there's 200 million tweets a day and 500 million YouTube, you know, uh, views a month, you've got this ability, just like in the Coney 2012, for things to go viral, you know, right away and, and very quickly. And at the bottom, you've got money. You've got uh, the millennials that, that have $40 billion in discretionary um, purchasing ability. 
And you've got moms that have become an incredible force, not only in the mom blogging communities, but also in the household and controlling over 80% of the purchasing decisions. And what do millennials and moms have, have in common? They really have in common that they're really much more cause oriented than 50-year-old you know, men. So those people, all of a sudden, they really want to support causes. And then on the left side, you've got the consumer. So the consumer now, you know, over last year, 40% of consumers said that they actually bought a product because of a cause-related um, aspect to it. That's double what it was in, 19, in 1993. You also have 80% of consumers saying they want businesses to be more cause-oriented. You have over 80% of people saying they would actually buy a more expensive product or actually try a new product, which is even more challenging to get people to do if it was, if it was a cause-based. And all these forces you know, really give us, I think, an obligation as consumers. And that whatever we're buying, we should do a little homework on it. We should make sure that it, it's supporting the right cause. And, if, and by God, if they say you know, they're cause-oriented, you know, dig a little deep on it to make sure that they're actually not charlatans that are just saying it to be commercial you know, about it. Go on their websites. You know? When you go on the NECA website and you drill down on where we've donated our money, I have contact information, I have emails, I have telephone numbers. I encourage people to communicate, to, to add, call these people and talk to them. Oftentimes, I'll drill down on somebody's cause-based pay and it'll be a dead link. And you kind of know there's a problem when it's a dead link, right? But even beyond that, if you're buying something, we as, as consumers have the ability to control what we buy. And there's lots of good products out there. Choose one that's got a, good, it's got a good cause to it. So these give back brands, you've heard of some of these, um, I'm sure some of the littler companies on the top. Um, you know, and you probably are wondering, well, why do you have Kroger on there? Why do you have Walmart on there? And you know, the reality of it is Kroger, large grocery chain, you know, donates 12% of their pre-tax profits to charities. You know, Walmart, for all the crap that they get, they donate $2.5 billion in product and cash you know, each year. So it's not just happening with these trendy you know, entrepreneurial startup brands. It's also happening with these you know, larger brands that are really doing it in a, in a meaningful way. I wanted to leave you with some lessons learned you know, and these cut largely across all kinds of entrepreneurship, whether it's, you know, social, or commercial, whatever. You know, and the first is begin with the end in mind. How many of you have uh, read the book The Seven Habits by Stephen Covey? That's pretty good. So usually when I talk to college students, you know, no one's ever heard of who Stephen Covey is. <laughs> so I would really encourage you over the summer, pick up a copy of that book, read it. It's a great, easy read. It's all practical common sense, but it puts it in a really great framework. One of the concepts that he talks about is begin with the end in mind. Think about where you want to get to and then work backwards to where you are now and then develop your plan. And anytime I buy a business or build a business, I write the selling memorandum you know, while I'm doing the due diligence to buy it. And why do I do that? Well, I do that because I want to see what holes I have in this business that I have to fill over the next three to five years while I'm building that company. So for example, if I, if I write that plan and I notice that there's no intellectual property, well, and I, I want to create some sizzle when I sell it, I know I got to build in some intellectual property, you know, in, into that business. The second thing is be transparent with your donations. I mentioned that earlier about, you know, just you got to be fully authentic, authentic and, and transparent with it. The third thing is act boldly with, you know, your financial backing. It's kind of like applying to Stanford. You don't want to just give it your, you know, old high school try and say, ah, oh, just whatever, whatever, whatever. You want to put your best foot forward, right? You know, or you're not going to get in. That doesn't mean, you know, don't tell the truth, but that means just kind of put it out there. People don't want to partner with somebody that, oh, that person's kind of a six out of ten. People don't want to partner with people like that. You know, find like-minded people. This relates more to the uh, give-back businesses. You know, in the traditional commercial uh, entrepreneurship, you can create options. You can do that kind of stuff. But if you're, if you're really a true give-back business, you know, you don't necessarily do that. So what you have to do is make people want to run through walls for you, you know, because they're inspired by the cause, because they love what you're doing. When we first started Nika, I had a woman um, or someone come to me and say, you know, that so-and-so on their Facebook has that they were a, a co-founder of Nika. And you know, they'd come a month or two later. And they, this person was kind of upset about it. And I said, hey, we just hit the lottery. That's great. I want everyone to feel like they're a co-founder of this. Because the more people that feel like this, the more they're going to want to run through walls to help us you know, with our brand and to help us achieve our mission, which is to end the worldwide you know, water crisis. So you really want to make people feel like it's everyone's, everyone's business. 
The product, has to, um, uh, the product has to be good, and it has to be priced competitively. I know that Whole Foods upper management, because I talk with them, they love Nika. You know, but when you get down into the trenches, if it doesn't have the inventory turns, if it doesn't have the profit margin for them, you know, those lower level people, frankly, their jobs are to you know, have maximize you know, asset efficiency and to maximize profit. So they're going to ultimately not keep it on the shelf even if the CEO you know, wants it. I mean, he may override it for a little bit, but eventually you know, it's not going to do that. So the product's got to have a good value proposition. I know a woman that has a maple syrup you know, that you know, fits everything. It's, it's, it's awesome, except it tastes horrible. You know, well, how many times are you going to buy this maple syrup even though it's got a great cause and it's really helping you know, her, her cause? You're not going to buy it that much. It's got to have a good value proposition. Outsource as much as you can. Keep your costs variable. You know, human nature is, you know, if I make it all myself, I can, you know, make it for a lower cost because I'm not paying that profit margin to one of my suppliers. Well, the reality of it is, if you're just starting something, first of all, you can't afford all the capital equipment or whatever you need to kind of get into that business. But those people that are, are suppliers, they're probably pretty darn good at it. Even though you're paying them a profit margin, you're probably getting it even cheaper than you could have been doing it on your own. And the other thing is, as you start to get bigger and bigger customers, as you're scaling your business, and if you're doing it all yourself, you're really not scalable if it's a product. Because they're not, you, you, you have to add more equipment. You have to add more capacity. But if you're outsourcing it, these people often, most of the time, have the capacity. So you can grow right with them. And it's a big, you know, it's a big opportunity uh, with, with your customers. The, uh, the eighth thing is learn on someone else's nickel. This doesn't mean screw up on someone else's nickel, but you know, if you've got the next Instagram, I mean, go for it. I mean, I think that's that's awesome. But you know, in reality, it's great if you can kind of learn, you know, get your feet wet, make a lot of mistakes, you know, for a few years or for some period of time to really learn, you know, you know what you you know what you need to do when it's really on your own. I make I probably make 20 mistakes a day. You know, I probably made 50 mistakes a day when I was younger. Uh, but my mistakes are less today than they were you know, 25, 25 years ago. You're going to make mistakes. This doesn't mean put your passion you know, on hold, but this may, maybe it means just kind of percolate it for a while while you're, you know, doing some, while you're working and, and, getting, and earning some money and creating some you know, economics and that kind of thing. The ninth thing is oftentimes people quit you know, when success is right around the corner. And I tell people, look, you know, unless it's systemically flawed, and it's very difficult to tell, but unless it's systemically flawed, keep pushing, keep persevering through it. You know, maybe you should ask your a mentor, ask a parent, ask a, a business person, ask a, a CEO of another company to kind of check and balance you to make sure that um, you know it is, it, you know, you are on the right track. But kind of push through that, you know, threshold to you know to persevere. Uh, find a partner or mentor who balances you. You know, we all are going to be good at, you know, one or two things, but we're not going to be good at five or six things that cut across all functional areas. And most people are, tend to be more left-brained or right-brained. And I find it's really important to partner with somebody that complements you. And this doesn't mean they have to be an equal owner. This doesn't even mean they have to be an owner at all. They could be a parent, they could be a, a professor, they could be a, you know, a, a friend, they can be a CEO of another company, but partner with somebody else. Because the minute you go to talk to investors, you know, they're going to start drilling you. And if you're, a, if, if you're a sales and marketing person, you know, and they start drilling you on cash flow, you know, and you go, uh-huh, I mean, you know, you're, you're done. It's over with that particular investor. So make sure you complement yourself with somebody that really can pull that stuff out. And the final thing is what I call the rule of twos. And that's that everything takes twice as long and costs twice as much money. It's just human nature. And that damn Excel. Excel makes everything really easy. Because we can make an Excel model look just really dynamite. And in reality, it's a lot harder to hit those models. And I find you know, it just takes a lot longer you know, than we think is human nature. So if you can, you know, run your models out for an extra you know, two years. Run your cash flows out for you know, double, the, double your costs. So that you really know, last thing you want to do is run out of money. And the last thing you want to do is run out of money when success is right around the corner. Because you're going to go out and raise money when you're out of money. And talk about dilution. You're going to get wiped out. You know, and then you're going to be really un unhappy. So you know, make sure you get enough capital up front so that you can kind of weather that uh, storm. So with that, I'll turn it over to some questions. Great. Do you want to? Perfect. Yeah. 
The video mentioned that Dika uh, donates 100 percent of its profits to uh, uh, those countries. So I wanted to ask that: How does it work out for a social enterprise that is that wants to invest in its own business to grow to a certain point? Is it like it goes to a certain point before we think about that number, or like how does that work out? When you see your, your, the question is, is you're figuring out how much to donate of your profits. I mean, when do you figure that out? In the beginning or as you get further into it? Yeah, like, do you get to a particular size? Like, because some, some sort of enterprise would want to invest in, in, in one growing before they decide that all of those profits should go. I mean, it's really up to, it's really up to you. I mean, if you, um, if you say you're donating a portion of your profits up front, you got to be really transparent, you know, with it. Or people that look at you are gonna, you know, say, "I'm not really sure that they're doing this for the for the right reasons," you know. So I think you have to do that. I mean, if your if your end goal is to, you know, you know, give back, but you really ultimately just really want to create economic return. I mean, I would focus on the economic return, make the business successful, and then over time, you know, add back a component into the, you know, giving back. You know, because in, if you if you muddy the water with investors. You know, it tends to, you know, investors typically either want to come in because it's a social venture, they really want to support you with that, or they want to come in because it's an economic return, you know, model that they're looking at. And if you mix those in and you go to a traditional VC, you know, they're going to say, well, I don't really, that's not what our investors, our limited partners are all about. You know, so they're probably not going to be as interested. So I guess my, uh, my answer to that question would be, you know, if you are really doing it ultimately that you want to give something back, you know, I would start with probably not giving something back, make it successful, and then when it's successful, you have a lot more flexibility to be able to do what you want to do with it. Yeah. I'm a, um, originally a student from South Korea, and I'm very interested in going to North Korea and doing social entrepreneurship there. And um, with the new leader, um, Kanye, I, I hope when um, or if ever um, North Korea ever opens up its doors to the world, um, how do you suppose that um, when foreign social entrepreneurs do go to North Korea, how do they fight um, like communist countries like North Korea where um, military power is absolute and um, there's high government corruption? And how do you talk to VCs into like, um, getting like, safe, safe funding? So the question is going from South Korea and doing some kind of a social venture in, in North Korea with a you know, difficult government uh, situation. And you know, I can only tell you, this isn't really the answer you probably want to hear, but I stay away from that kind of stuff. Um, the, we've done six projects, and the one project that failed was a project I did in Uganda, and it was an orphanage for um, child soldiers, and we built a well um, for a Christian organization. And um, the government came in and took not only the well, but they took the orphanage and they took the, they took the kids. It was horrific. And, you know, we, I try to work in, you know, agnostic, um, you know, uh, countries where I don't run that risk. I try to work in countries where governments aren't, um, you know, they actually like what we're doing because they don't have the money or the funds to, you know, to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, I don't really have a great answer for you other than I kind of try to stay away from some of that stuff. So, and I think VCs, are going to be very, very apprehensive about political risk. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm a student from India, and I spent a couple of summers ago interning in Zambia doing field work. And one of the really interesting debates that was going on at the time was uh, about the whole issue of aid. Uh, when you're, as a social enterprise, is it, uh, I think it's important to distinguish between philanthropy and actually, um, say, empowering the people there to be able to generate their own revenue and start their own businesses. What's your take on that? So the question is, um, uh, is, is aid and philanthropy and how engaged are you in, you know, with those, with those? making it a self-sustaining thing rather than just pumping rather it. Rather than just giving money, I mean, actually getting in from the ground up. And I, I, I think it's critical that you do grassroots, ground up, you know, up stuff. Any water project that we do, we actually go turn on. And I do that not so much because I'm worried that they're screwing around, but because I really know these executive um, directors of these NGOs. But I do it because I want to take people from the United States to actually help turn them on because when you know, they become transformed. But I would strongly um, uh, vote against just writing a check. I mean, it's all, they need checks. They need that kind of stuff. But oftentimes, if you write a check, 
and particularly if you write a check in the, just in the United States NGO, a lot of the a lot of the um, that that might get you know covered in admin expenses of that NGO. So I would really try to you know get engaged and not just give money to um, you know causes, but kind of get involved at the ground at, at um, you know at, at a groundworks level. And I mean you've heard of three cups of tea, you know probably, and you know there are some issues with you know what happened and all that. But you know the, one of the points I think is really great about three cups of tea is that you know as a, as Westerners we just want to go in and. You know, build the bridge. We just want to go in and do that. But in reality, if we don't actually develop relationships with the locals, engage them in what we're doing, have them feel a part of it, have them feel ownership, you know, then they feel like you know we're just giving them handouts, and it's not so much a hand up. So I really would encourage you to you know get engaged, you know, go there, touch and feel it, and you'll be so much more invigorated, you know, by it. But our question in the red back there. Uh, I first, I, I would like to commend you about NIFTA and what you did for philanthropy. My question to you is, when you first acquired your first company, how did you acquire the funding for it? Was it from investors or yeah. personal savings or family members? That's yeah, a really good, it's a really good question. So that first job that I mentioned that I went to after you know my cut, paste, and attach experience um, was a middle market company. Part of the reason I chose that company was because they had just gone through a, a, a private equity transaction. So there was a lot of debt, you know, not a lot of equity, you know, going into it. And part of me going there was, you know, they allowed me to invest, you know, whatever amounts I could put in, which wasn't a lot. I, did, I, I didn't really have any money, but I went to a bank. It was at a time when banks would be willing to, to lend. And I borrowed hundred thousand dollars. Was able to take that hundred thousand dollars, dumped it all into the uh, into the into the into the business, and that over that twelve year period, that company did pretty well, and it generated enough seed capital for me to go off on my own and you know put that money to work alongside you know other you know partners, and um, and then I worked with banks and uh, private equity firms to come in and take a portion of that business, and I put my own you know capital in to, to help do that. Yeah. So I kind of have a small worry with models like Nika's in that it almost seems too good to be true. Like you have distributors like Walmart and retailers who are really profiting off these higher margins, like you said. Um, you're benefiting these organizations that you're supporting, and then also as an organization, you're also profiting. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any unforeseen, um, I don't know, problems of some sort that may arise because of this? In yeah. some way? Uh, so the the question is the type of model that we're doing. You know, is it authentic? Are people perceiving it? Are we going to have an issue you know, down the road? Even though Nika donates all of its profits, you know, we're selling through retailers that certainly aren't you know doing that you know as well. And I mean, I think it all comes back to authenticity and transparency. And if we're really authentic and transparent about it, yeah, I mean, some people are going to not believe it, you know, but I don't really care. I mean, you know, because at the end of the day, if I'm doing good in my heart and I'm creating value and I'm, and I'm doing what I'm saying I'm doing so that I'm not being a charlatan and saying it, you know, there are going to be some people that actually, you know, don't believe me. And there's lots of people that don't believe that, you know, oh, it's too good to be true. You can't be donating 100 percent of your, your, your profits. And, you know, I say, OK, well, if you don't want to, if that's, that's fine. You know, that, that's, your, that's your model. There are um, uh, there is a new development of what's called a certified B corporation. You know that's kind of evolving. It's kind of the equivalent of uh, the fair trade um, for the coffee, uh, the coffee importation. And it's um, it's it's there's only about 500 companies that are part of it yet. We're not. I probably will become part of it because I think it will enhance uh, credibility. But basically, what it is is you are very transparent about what you're doing, and they come in and they audit that transparency. You know, so there's another kind of check and balance, if you will, with it. So I think um, you're going to see a shakeout over time. And you do hear about you know, people that start businesses. I mean, the, the breast cancer, you know, uh, pink ribbon. I mean, there are you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, I don't know how many companies that you know, are you know, not doing the right thing by it. I mean, they, they say they're donating $20 of every purchase, but if you read the very fine print, they have a cap at, at you know, $20,000 or something. And yet they're, you know, they're marketing it that way. So I think in the end this will shake out because you are seeing a movement to it, but it's going to, it's going to have to have you know, more, not regulation, but more kind of boundaries you know, to, help it, to help it shake out. Yeah. Hi. So you mentioned like to be persistent, never give up. But isn't there? When do you know to give up? So the question is, when do you know to give up um, and uh, not continue to be persistent, not continue to throw good money after bad or your time? 
It's so hard. I mean, that's why I think it's um, important to have a mentor. And again, it doesn't have to be a partner, but have a mentor that can check and balance you and that somebody that can you know, really you know, test your strategic plan, test where you're at, test the, you know, do a SWOT analysis with you. I mean, you can present your SWOT analysis to them you know, in terms of what you're looking at, and they can say, you know, I think you got a hole here. I don't agree with you here. I think you're unrealistically optimistic here. I think it's going to cost you more money to do you know, your marketing campaign here than you think. And at the end of the day, I, mean, you, I, I look at things like data points. So I'll ask 25 people you know, their opinion on you know, what I'm doing. And I kind of put those, some people think, well, what are you doing? I mean, it's not like a democracy. It's your business, Jeff. And it's not a democracy. But I want to put all those data points up on the wall. And then, I, and then how I see that, I draw my line. And I draw my line of that data points based on what I'm hearing and based on what I'm interpreting. So I would encourage you to do that. I do think most people quit as a generalization you know, uh, too early just as a generalization, but that's purely a generalization. I think sometimes success is kind of right around the corner and you just got to you know, persevere with it. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on her question, um, I was wondering how we can make the social impact sustainable and to make it grow. Because um, I understand you, you, just, you just can't go into an area and um, you, you, you build something there, right? And you're hoping that it would, uh, you could leave it and it could grow and um, grow exponentially and it, it, the, the, that impact could also um, travel to other areas. But you, you would, um, it would be better if um, it would not be you anymore who's doing that. It would be the community itself that you empowered. And I was wondering if you're, um, you're also part of um, not, just, not just building the infrastructure for the water, but also um, empowering the people themselves to look after themselves and to start um, thinking about ideas on how to improve their own lives. <coughs> Right. So the question is, I mean, how do you ensure that you got sustainability, you know, in a particular project once you once you start it? And, you know, uh, first of all, we work with NGOs. We don't, NECA doesn't actually build the wells themselves. We donate to specific wells and specific projects that we do. And we work with a handful of NGOs that we've vetted. And the NGOs that we work with have a holistic um, approach to poverty alleviation. So they're focused on water, they're focused on health care, they're focused on education, and they're focused on microfinance. You know, because if you fix the if you fix the, the, the body but you don't fix the water supply, the body's not going to stay fixed. And you really have to, you know what I do, you have to holistically, you know, solve it. And they also are very um, focused on community engagement, community involvement, and really engaging those communities. I would not encourage anyone just to, you know, write a check for a single you know, project out there and expect it to stay. Most of the time you find, what I find in, in the developing world is that projects are, you know, left half finished. And you've got, it's, the countryside is littered by wells that were started, but because they didn't have that community engagement, they didn't have that community involvement, or they ran out of funds, or they didn't have that holistic bottom-up approach, you know, it, it, it wasn't sustainable. So I really think it's important to, to, you know, make it as sustainable as you can, as holistic as you can. Please join me in thanking Jeff Church for this incredible, inspiring talk.